it is uh, a real privilege for me to be here today and to be labeled a thought leader. This is a heavy responsibility, friends. <laughs> and so I'll try to look as wise as I possibly can. Um, those of you who know me will know that that's quite a struggle, but here we go. Um, let me begin by saying that I was told that I could talk about any particular thing that I wanted to, and of course I had a very long list. But the thing that keeps coming up to the top of my list year after year after year is what I've chosen to talk about today. And it is particularly relevant because we have wonderful news from New York State, and that is what you may already know, that we changed our Nurse Practice Act this year, well, actually in December, uh, in such a way as to require that anyone graduating from an associate degree or diploma program must complete the BSN within 10 years of licensure or have their license placed on hold. <laughs> so this has been my quest for many, many years. I have uh, been one of the people out there beating my head against the wall on this issue, as many of you have been as well. And it's nice to see some kind of a break in this. Uh, 10 years may be too long, in my opinion, but that's OK. Uh, I'm all right with that. At least we got something going. Um, you may also be interested to know how long we've been talking about this. 1927. The first person who said nurses should be educated in four-year college programs was a social scientist who studied nursing, Esther Lucille Brown. Now, she, that is a name that none of you know, but those of us who are truly old <laughs> studied her in graduate school. Uh, I'm not telling you how old I am, but I'm plenty old enough to have studied her. Um, unfortunately, the nursing profession didn't pay much attention to this idea, nor did anybody else, until 1965 when the ANA House of Delegates passed the 1965 proposal that all nurses should be educated in baccalaureate. Well, my dear, it passed with a lot of debate at microphones. I was there. I was one of the people up at a microphone. I have no idea what I said. <laughs> I don't even know if I spoke pro or con. I suspect it was pro. Um, in any case, a diploma school graduate myself, of course, you see, it, it was uh, one of the things that I did think was important. I didn't think you should graduate from school and spend the rest of your life trying to pursue yet another degree, which is, of course, what I did with my life. Um, <clears throat> and while that declaration created debate across this nation, everybody in nursing was talking about it, it's, nothing happened, as you obviously know. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the rest of the history, although it is depressing and interesting at the same time. But I do want to talk about my own history with this to give you an idea how I came to be as passionate as I am about the problem. Uh, I completed my doctorate and took my first job as a CNO with that degree in my hand, and I was going to set the world on fire. I secured a position as the CNO in a very large hospital in Brooklyn, New York, where, in fact, I found two kinds of nurses on the staff. We had a lot of diploma nurses, a lot, and we had associate degree graduates. We had very, very few, if any, baccalaureate graduates at that time. Although we had some of the, graduate program, uh, the baccalaureate programs affiliating at our hospital, we had practically none of them on the staff except for six or seven who had joined the staff brand new from a brand new program at SUNY Downstate. The rest of our new graduates were all from associate degree programs, and we had plenty of them. My initial experience came from my theoretical underpinnings about this because I'm a teacher's college graduate. Mildred Montag, the person who invented associate degree education for nurses, was one of my faculty. I understood the principles of professional and technical nursing. And by gosh, we were going to do that. Except that, as you know, that didn't work. It doesn't work in practice, sadly enough. And Mildred, I think, by the time she finished her life, began to understand that very well, which was, in a sense, really sad. But what brought me to my understanding of what we needed was my experience right there, and it had to do with patient care episodes. 
I'm going to share one with you to give you an example of how shocking it was at that time. One of our head nurses had a staph infection, was in the hospital, and was very ill. And I went up to see her, oxygen running. I put my hand on her hand and said, you know, I'm so sorry and whatever. She started to cry. And I thought, she's crying because she's so sick. When she got a hold of herself, she said, Dr. McClure, the nurses on this floor don't know what they're doing. What? This is not the news you want to hear from one of your expert nurses. <laughs> oh, what was the matter? Well, I have to have soaks to my leg three times a uh, day. And one nurse came in and got my bed bath, bath basin out to, my bath basin out to put, do the soaks. Remember, she has a staph infection already. Okay. Another one came in and she already had her gloves on when she opened the door. You know, this, is, this isn't uh, expert nursing. This isn't, we're not talking about high level stuff here. We're talking about basic things. And of course, when I finished, you know, with my shock, I ran down to the nursing office and said, who in the world are the people that we have up on the fifth floor in this building? And she's, my associate who did all the hiring got out of Rolodex and starts telling, I don't want to know their names. Where did we get them from? Associate degree, associate degree, associate degree. And I said to myself, you know, I cannot take, teach people basic nursing techniques. This is not what we're in the business to do. We have to have people come to us as safe practitioners to start with. And so I suddenly had a whole new insight into what was going on. Now, I want to share with you that this is a little harsh, it sounds. But in those days, the associate degree program really was four semesters. It no longer is, you know. You do know it's long, right? It's, it's, we call it the two-year program. It hasn't been two years and years. Uh, just thought I'd, in case you were unaware of that, and I can't imagine you were unaware of it. So this brought me to begin to get very involved in thinking things through. And very soon, on the heels of this experience, I was called to a meeting where the deans of the uh, baccalaureate program, both baccalaureate and higher degree programs, had been to their state meeting, and they were all sent home to meet with their VPs for nursing to try to discuss what, were in, what was, in fact, the role of the professional nurse. They were interested in a role for the baccalaureate person because that's who they were preparing. And they didn't have a good statement, and they wanted us to come up with one. So everybody was going back to their respective regions of New York to do that, and I was called to this meeting. We worked on that. There were several of us as VPs and several deans, and we worked really hard. And we began to meet once a month. And what we finally realized is preparation for a single license requires a single education because we only really have one RN license. And kidding ourselves that we have a technical level who also gets the RN, and therefore the same salary, right? I mean, we, might, we may give a little differential, but it isn't anything. You say to yourself, to most employers, an RN's an RN. They really aren't going to differentiate. We're slicing the onion too, onion too thin. So we began working on a new practice act, this little group. And we kept meeting. And we put together a proposal that we sent, took to the legislature. Our proposal was to change the Nurse Practice Act in such a way that technical nurses would, that licensed practical nurses would be prepared in associate degree programs, and RNs would be prepared in baccalaureate programs. Well, I don't have to tell you. That created a great deal of Strom and Durham across the entire state. We had people marching. We had all kinds of things. I think the other thing I should share with you, which is really important to understand in case you're thinking about changing your Nurse Practice Act, one of the things you have to do is to hit people, the legislators in particular, but their close compatriots and the people we work with, where the dollar is. We have to think about the dollar. One of the things we didn't consider, because we were running around trying to convince the nursing 
community that this was a good thing. They didn't all think so. Gee, I guess you're shocked. Uh, who didn't think so mostly? Community college presidents. Their largest major, right? Their most successful major. All their graduates get jobs. They don't, and by the way, they also talked about preparing professionals in their associate degree program. So we had this little problem. You, see, you should know, by the way, in case you have to deal with this, community college presidents are much closer to legislators than you and I are because they get their money from those guys. And they're really close. They're really tight. So all they needed was a call. In addition, I regret to say that the hospital administrators wanted nothing to do with it. They saw it as costing more money. And in fact, it really wasn't going to cost them that much money, but they thought they were. And they definitely fought us on it. They never supported it at all. The question that you have to have about hospital administrators then is how come you got this new law through? Where were they on that? And to get back to my dollar idea, we were very fortunate in the beginning. We didn't have any support from them at all. They weren't fighting us as hard, but they didn't, they didn't care. They didn't want it. They had nothing to do with it. No, when they talked to legislators, they were not for it at all. And then along came pay for performance. You all know about pay for performance, don't you? Yeah. And we had lots of great data showing that baccalaureate graduates make a difference in patient outcomes. Why do we have that? Because my personal hero, Linda Aiken, and her staff, and wonderful many staffs at the University of Pennsylvania, have shown us, oh my goodness. And it's not just minor differences. Mortality rates are different. Well, if you're going to do evidence-based administration, you know, we keep talking about evidence-based practice, you better pay attention to that. They turned on a dime almost. When I got word, because I had not been involved in the group that was, I thought I wouldn't jinx them by staying involved with the group that was introducing the legislation. I'd been so dismally a failure in this. When I heard that the hospital administration group had turned around and said, we're supporting this wholeheartedly. I said, whoa, who drugged them? What's going on up there? I mean, it just seemed like such a complete turnaround. But now we know. You hit somebody where the dollar is, you're going to get support or lack of support big time. So one of the places, I've, I've been involved in a struggle to raise our standards for quite a long time. And uh, this struggle just seems to go on and on. Um, one of the things that through the American Academy of Nursing I had a chance to do was to work with a group that was looking at educational preparation. They were interested in all levels, and we looked at all levels. But we kept going back to entry. If you don't have good entry levels, numbers, big numbers, at the baccalaureate level, you see you can't feed your graduate programs. And let me say to you, friends, we're coming up on another shortage. And the, at least they tell us we are. And the last shortage we had was very much related to the fact that we were short of faculty. It's very hard get a, to get enough faculty, i.e. people with masters and doctoral, but particularly doctoral degrees, if in fact they don't start out with a baccalaureate. You know, there aren't many people in this country that have doctoral degrees who started with associate degrees. There are some, but you don't meet them every day. It's a really long path. I'm sharing all this with you because we have reason to be concerned, too, that we don't have a good feeder to our graduate programs, which we know we really need desperately. Uh, I will tell you at that time we discovered that there was an interesting and fascinating uh, project going on in Oregon where, in fact, because they are all their, or their community colleges, of course, are state-supported, but so is their major university. Uh, they had a project going on whereby a student coming into an associate degree program could dual register for the baccalaureate as well and could begin through their associate degree program to take online 
baccalaureate courses. And then they would have in their mind they were a baccalaureate registrant, they were going on. And many of them did. Uh, we got kind of interested in that, and Brenda Cleary and I began a project to try to introduce the same uh, idea into two states, the one she lives in, which is North Carolina, and New York State, which uh, is where I obviously reside and where I was practicing. Uh, our project was not a great success. Why was that? Well, in the 90s, when we began thinking about this and working on it, we were very short of students to go into nursing. I don't know about you, but I noticed something really weird happened when we turned the century. When we got into the 21st century, all of a sudden, people wanted to go into nursing. They thought nursing was a good thing. Men wanted to go into nursing in larger numbers. Really? The baccalaureate programs were not having any trouble getting students. They had had empty seats before, not any trouble now. And they didn't want the associate degree students. Thank you very much. I don't want to get involved with this. This is too complex a project. And so, of course, we didn't really succeed. It's a very sad thing, but that's it. The baccalaureate folks just couldn't help us out. Uh, and today, if you talk to baccalaureate deans privately, they'll tell you they still don't want to take associate degree people in to complete their baccalaureate degrees. It's too bad, but that's a fact. And you have to sort of face up to it. Um, OK. What's fascinating to think about, and I hope I'm not talking too long to take your time, but I really want you to think about this, because I don't think we do enough, is that our long struggle is not anything like what the other healthcare professions have done. Not so long ago, the pharmacists decided they needed to have a doctoral degree. So they changed their standards and they have to get doctoral degrees. So then the PTs decided they had to have doctoral degrees, so they have doctoral degrees. Now the OTs are having doctoral degrees. As far as I know, the social workers are still at the master's level, but nobody ever told them to go to associate degree programs. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel that their scope of practice is about this wide, each of them. I'm not lying. Think about it. The scope of practice of nurses is as wide as the outdoors. It doesn't quit. Our responsibilities are serious. On top of that, so we have this, this scope problem. I would suggest to you we also have a depth problem. I was the hospital administrator at NYU Medical Center for my last 10 years there. Don't be too impressed. It wasn't, but it was, I was. Anyway, Tom Smith knows the truth. You can talk to him later. Uh, the truth of the matter is, in all that time, I don't remember having an incident report from any of those other disciplines. They're not high risk to patients. You know, I have to tell you something. I respect them all. I certainly respect PTs. I'm their steady customer. <laughs> Something's always out of order, you know? Yeah, struggle along toward the end of your life, you find all these things happening to you, which you really didn't think would. I was sure I was going to be fine to the end and, you know, get hit by a car or something. That's what I had in mind. But uh, I want you to think that through. All these other professions, and here we are. On top of that, we have a very different role from the rest of them. And I'm going to talk about hospitals because I only know about hospitals. Uh, I, I want acute care patients. I want people in bed connected to as much equipment as we can find. You know, if they get up and walk around, they make me really nervous. So I've always been at that end. But, you know, it, it's, it's sort of interesting to think about how organizations work and what they do. There were, there were two uh, social scientists who studied organizations who talked about complex organizations and how they function. And they said complex organizations, which we all know, are divided up into departments. Mm, everybody's got inside their department their own culture, their own norms, their own rules, their own regulations. And that's the, but inside every single complex organization, a role arises that they call the integrator. 
The integrator is the person that takes the work from all those departments, puts it together, and makes a product. Otherwise, it would all remain out there. And I would suggest to you that in hospitals, the nurse is the integrator. The nurse is the person who's calling all these people and telling them, you know, we really need somebody to see this patient, da 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 da. I had a friend tell me recently she was upset. Her mother was discharged. She hadn't had a nutritionist see her. She really needed that. I said, where was the nurse? I didn't say, where was the nutritionist? Right? OK, so we know who to blame. <laughs> it's the integrator. I would suggest to you another name is interdisciplinary team leader. I like that better. But you will note the interdisciplinary team leader is the least well prepared among all the disciplines. Does that make any sense to you? When you think about this responsibility and level of knowledge that we have to have? So integrators are not, here we go. We've never had, by the way, a critical shortage of any of those other disciplines that made the headlines in the newspapers. I've never seen a headline that said, we're short of pharmacists. We're short of social workers. Oh my god, what are we going to do? You get a nursing shortage. Time magazine has a lead article, right? So when I say scope and then I say depth, you see what I'm talking about. This is a profession that better get a little more understanding of our responsibilities and take a little more seriously how we prepare people for this practice. This practice is complex, and it matters a lot. So I will say also to you that one of the reasons why our, our shortages are so worrisome is not just because we need so many numbers, but also because our preparation now has changed. Although an awful lot of people think the answer when we have a shortage is to just get more people and go get them from anywhere and shove them in, because anybody can be a nurse. You know that. All you need is a kind heart, strong back, and a good pair of feet. <laughs> uh, but you know, that is the image a lot of people have of us. And the fact that we have been so slow with our educational process is part of our problem. You know what we've done? We have continually raised the ceiling in nursing education and never raised the floor. We still have diploma school kids. I'm from Pennsylvania, the land of diploma schools. But there's other lands of diploma schools out there. OK, so that still leaves a lot of our care in the hands of people who, in fact, have not quite got the preparation that we really need for what patients need. And I would suggest to you this patient care needs, as patient care moves more and more out of inpatient settings, and is out there in the community, where nursing goes on unsupervised, and where the nurses out there have no one to turn to to ask questions. You're looking at someone who had a visiting nurse in her home not so long ago, who was a brand new graduate, taking care of a terminally ill patient. That was fun. The poor thing was a wreck. And unfortunately, I think somebody must have told her I was a nurse, which didn't help anything. <laughs> uh, I'm sharing this all with you because I will say to you right now, a responsibility for the change in our practice education requirements rests with you. The members of this organization are the people who have to lead this effort. You have to push and push and push. You have to push to get your Nurse Practice Act changed because that will do a great deal to change your, your uh, situation. But short of that, there is no reason not to push in your own setting. Many settings today are doing that. There are settings around our, uh, in New York City who are, in fact, demanding that anyone who comes on board without the baccalaureate must complete it within five years. But my concern is I don't think they track it well enough. You have to pay attention to that. You have to, in fact, put it in the evaluation. You have to see how many credits people took. You don't take their word for it. So what I'm saying to you is, 
you guys are the people who have to lead this charge because nobody else is going to do it. The, I can assure you the educators are not. They're perfectly happy with the way things are. They have enough students, and they aren't worried about anybody else's level, whatever that level may be. But once again, we are soon going to need many more people out of graduate education for the future than we do now. That means we can't afford to have everybody prepared in community colleges. And we have to start to push back. The respect for nursing is such that people think it can prepare, be prepared anywhere, and you can't. Now, I have to tell you that my point of view on this has made me have a bullseye on my back. Not very popular, and that's okay. You won't be either, and you're, it's okay. You can live with that. You have to think about patient care first. So that is my thought leader com set of comments for today. I'd like to hear from you what's going on in your states. What are you doing, if anything? Oh, no, I wanted to do one more thing. I wanted to talk about the people who were helpful in getting, it, getting the bill passed, because I know that Deborah Zimmerman is in the audience, except I've lost track of her. Here she is right here in orange. Deb was on the group that was up in Albany, pushing, 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 before she got mixed up and moved to Virginia. <laughs> what can I tell you? But she knows everything there is to know about this act. So if you ask me questions that I can't answer, I know Deb can answer them. I also have good materials that I can share with you if you want them shared. Uh, we had a wonderful group of people, uh, nurse educators, people from practice, a, a woman who gave us great leadership, who was retired. In fact, I think she took an early retirement to work on this a registered nurse who worked for the state board. And she didn't just do nursing, she did all the, all the health professions. But she cared about this a lot, and she knew what needed to go into the act and how it had to be written, so she was extraordinary. And then she wrote a newsletter every single Friday to this enormous group of people all over the state, and maybe the country for all I know. She moved to Florida herself and never stopped. We're still getting newsletters from her, in spite of the fact the act has passed. But there's stuff going on around it that she sends us. Her name is Barbara Zattel, and she's, from my point of view, one of the saints, right up there with a lot of the others like Deb Zimmerman. Thank you so much, everyone. It's wonderful Thank to be you, here. Thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.